And with that, let's get back to what we're all here for. This is an event that GMF organizes within the Rethink CEE Fellowship. This is a program that GMF started a couple of years ago in order to support research uh, on policy changes in the Central and Eastern Europe region. What we do with this program in particular is that we are uh, supporting next generation experts, analysts, also civic activists from the region uh, to conduct policy research over the duration of one year. That typically then results in a policy paper that we publish and, uh, and present within this format. Uh, one of our guests today, Bogdana Depo, is a Rethink CE Fellow. She has been with us for uh, the last two years. Bogdana is Ukrainian by origin. She works at the European Parliament on EU foreign policy, also on the future of Europe. Uh, she was previously a researcher at a number of think tanks in Brussels, in Maastricht, and in Kiev. Uh, she holds a PhD from Cologne University in Germany and Charles University in the Czech Republic. And she also holds a master's degree uh, from the College of Europe and Kiev National University. She is joined today by Elisa Neviadomska, who is a counsel in charge of public procurement uh, at the Legal Transition Program of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Elisa is a senior expert with many years of experience in the area of legislative reform, especially also in the area of procurement public procurement in Eastern Europe, and she will be uh, discussing with us the findings of uh, Bogdana's research and paper. Welcome to both of you, Bogdana and Elisa. Good morning, now, over thank to... you so much for the invitation. You're most welcome, we're delighted to have you on. Uh, with both of them, we will today discuss the issue of e-procurement uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, this is a topic that has moved to the fore in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, most of you will obviously be aware that corruption is one of the key challenges uh, to the Eastern Europe region. Uh, it basically uh, attacks uh, the countries of the region, at least on three, uh, uh, on three fronts. Uh, one is that it obviously impedes any uh, political reform processes, institutional consolidation, democratic and rule of law developments in uh, individual countries. The second is that it hampers also the, the social and economic development uh, of individual countries. Uh, and the third is that it also undermines the security and sovereignty of, uh, uh, of these countries. So, uh, it's a multiple uh, challenge that basically arises from this uh, uh, from this issue of corruption, uh, which to be sure is not one that is limited to Eastern Europe, but it's particularly uh, pronounced and particularly consequential, I would argue, in uh, in the Eastern Europe region. Uh, now there are some good uh, sort of provides a spotlight, as it were, on the issue of uh, e-procurement which has been hailed by some as a, uh, as a good way out of at least some of the dilemmas that are facing uh, uh, Eastern European countries in the, uh, in the field of corruption. Um, this is a piece of good news, I would argue, a rare one that comes out of, uh, of Eastern Europe. Uh, and I'm delighted that Bogdana has been able to do research on this issue within her fellowship. She published a paper uh, uh, just a day ago I will uh, in a minute share the link to that paper on the, uh, on the GMF website. But for the time being, I'm going to turn it over to Bogdana uh, to give us the key insights of her research on the e-procurement in three countries of Eastern Europe, in Georgia, in Ukraine, and in Moldova. Bogdana, go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Jörg, obviously, for this program for a possibility to participate and for your team uh, for their support throughout the progress and uh, the process of writing the paper. And uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Elisa as a commentator. Uh, for me, it's a number one uh, e-procurement expert uh, in Europe, uh, which is both uh, a huge privilege, but obviously uh, quite a challenge uh, to, uh, to see um, the comments on my paper. But uh, 
I hope it all goes well. Uh, I would like to, first of all, uh, say that um, I speak on my personal capacity, so my research is not linked to the institution I'm currently working for. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, yours uh, uh, presentation and like introduction, uh, Jörg, uh, to this was interesting uh, because this is exactly uh, why I was motivated to do this research is firstly, because for me, it was interesting to show and to find out for myself, are there amazing successful uh, stories of reforming that would counter this trends which we often see in the news uh, saying uh, uh, speaking only about corruption speaking only about work speaking only about all these negative uh, trends that we uh, see with regards to the region and secondly uh, for me I, I was always interested in digital transformation however again uh, news trends are often very negative uh, with regards to news we often speak uh, about disinformation fake news, how artificial intelligence is used against the governance. And for me, it was interesting to see, actually, is there a success story? Can we use uh, digital uh, tools to foster democracy, to fight corruption, to somehow improve the governance? And actually, e-procurement is an example to this. Why? Because uh, so with regards to uh, corruption, for example, I can just uh, cite you the data, uh, which is actually in my paper. So after having implemented this reform, Georgia has saved already 300 million euros just in few years. Moldova only in one year, uh, only in one year, 25 million. Ukraine, well, obviously it's a question of the size of the country, but in four years it has saved more than three billion euros. So this is an amazing, uh, uh, amazing uh, numbers. Uh, briefly for this uh, audience, what is about what is this uh, e-procurement and procurement in general? So the state is the big, the biggest, so to say, businessman. Uh, the state is the one who buys for our taxpayers' money everything, like starting from the hospital, schools, books, builds, uh, roads, etc. Before, until recently, this and actually today in many countries, this is a huge uh, black hole in many cases, uh, in many countries, because this is where the money goes flying out because it's there is very, very little of scrutiny. So what, uh, and Georgia was a first pioneer to actually open up this black box. And what they did, actually it was behind, uh, it was during the times of, uh, at that time, President uh, Saakashvili, who has promoted this openness, transparency, uh, um, inclusion of all different type of stakeholders into the process. So what, uh, what the Georgian reformers did, they have installed a very simple uh, tool online where everyone would see everything, meaning that all stakeholders would participate in e-procurement. There would be no hidden information. There would be no corrupt element. The, um, the data which would be online would never be deleted. So meaning that the civil society would go back and forth and scrutinize and could uh, reread the information and uh, come back to it later. Uh, but not only civil society, but also for example, law enforcement bodies. Uh, the very genius uh, uh, new innovative component which was established was a reversed auction, which means, for example, before uh, the state uh, would procure and nobody would know for which price, who actually is the one who is uh, uh, serving and uh, delivering this uh, product. Now, not only that the product would be would have a fixed uh, often uh, market price, but the competitor, but the businesses could compete by going down the price. For example, someone would say, uh, we would uh, sell this, uh, I don't know, let's say chairs uh, to state for uh, 20 euros and the others would be going down, down, down. So this is how the state would again, once again, save uh, lots of eventually millions, uh, as we see according to statistics. So, and the last um, very good uh, uh, new kind of component was that there was a committee uh, that would look into cases in case if any of the stakeholders would freeze the process in the middle. 
So anybody could freeze it and the committee would go back and would look into the case and would look into the documents and try to see if there is malfunction. So now we come to Ukraine. Ukraine actually took up the whole, uh, let's say, the general philosophy, but it was already a few years later. So the, obviously the di digitalization and the progress went further. The biggest question for Ukrainians, and especially after having learned the Georgian case, was, well, Ukrainians knew at that moment that maybe there will be political will, strong political will, maybe not. So the basic question was like, how to make sure that the e-procurement would not rely solely on the state? How to make it as a perfect um, private-public um, uh, project? And the idea was actually that they would make a hybrid model. And this is what you can see in a paper as a golden triangle, where the state is responsible for the regulations and uh, all the laws, where the business came with the first step, meaning by establishing the e-platforms. So any type of company which would like to go into the public uh, tenders, would have to go through any of those, any, and this is the key word, of those uh, uh, e-platforms and the activities of these e-platforms is regulated by the law. So in reality, the first entry point is coming through the companies which compete between themselves because the companies offer to the businesses different type of services. Some say we will offer you a legal consultancy throughout your tender process. Others give training, others give uh, accountants, etc., etc. So this was actually a very revolutionary because for the first time the e-procurement was not standing and sitting only with the government, but was kind of like part of the service was externalized to the business, which was equal participant to the process. And the final element, which was very interesting with regards to Ukraine, is uh, also artificial intelligence. So the question was, what do we do with all this overwhelming data? And the reply was that actually artificial intelligence through a new system was analyzing all the data to see if there is any type of misconduct or mistakes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So obviously, uh, artificial intelligence does it very well, and then only the selected cases of the problematic ones, without names of the companies, go straight to the civil society, and civil society then sits and analyzes if there is actually uh, misconduct. Final example is Moldova. And I speak of these countries actually in a uh, historical perspective, because Moldova is the recent case. Uh, Moldova uh, took up Ukraine's uh, 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 blueprint, thanks uh, to uh, EBRD's uh, support. And then uh, actually this blueprint already included the knowledge of what Georgia did, of what Ukraine did, and now, uh, now Moldova, it was Moldova's turn. It came in a, a fortunate and unfortunate moment at the same time, because it was in the moment of a political crisis when a lot of money have disappeared from the banks. So there was this will and interest of the state uh, actors at that moment to actually create a system within which none of the money, uh, at least uh, in public procurement would simply disappear. So, um, so actually, Moldova has also had a very strong advantage because many years before, the previous government has established a set of e-components, including e-signature, which is very unique, actually. And, um, and they have embedded all of this. And actually, Moldova today is the only country which has completely finished uh, and closed uh, the cycle of, e -pro of uh, procurement, of the public procurement in with all the e uh, component, components. So up till until present, Moldova, Moldova's uh, system, if uh, hopefully it will be uh, fully functional soon, it will be the most, uh, uh, well, uh, the most uh, advanced uh, um, uh, e-procurement that exists uh, in the region. So this all brings me to a few interesting conclusions. Firstly, so there is actually different 
everybody had their own different uh, reform pace and the reform challenges and actors, etc. You can see it all in the paper. However, some rules and some basic things worked very well for everyone. Like, for example, that bringing in transparency, digitalizing, putting everything online, not deleting information, how uh, the data is used for the benefit uh, of the uh, procurement uh, reform itself. So there was a, so to say, a learning domino from Georgia to Ukraine, from Ukraine to Moldova. And this was thanks also to the digital progress, because we can see how the digitalization has evolved through years and how it has fostered this, uh, uh, this uh, actually reform. So in reality, uh, uh, you, York, you have mentioned at the presentation that at the beginning that actually the corruption components were taken out simply by opening and by making the system transparent and simply by um, taking away the, uh, the corrupt elements which were pre previously hidden by a very small circle of the officials. So now, simply by taking out uh, these corrupt elements, by opening up the system, but by allowing everyone to participate, by allowing everyone to monitor, uh, this is how we uh, have managed uh, to save so much money uh, in for the state uh, budget, actually. Legislate now, next point, legislation. Obviously, legislation is a key. But uh, each of these uh, pilots is started actually as a uh, uh, as a pilot, and they started on a small sum of money, and only then the big uh, legislation has followed. But the success stories and this inspiration was built actually on small on uh, small amounts of money to show the state and the publics and to make the business motivated to compete for the tenders. Uh, political will is obviously key, but again, it's not the most detrimental uh, element because, for example, in some countries, it was very strongly pushed by the international donors as well as the civil society. But still, the political will has uh, has to be there. It is important and the ideal situation is when all stakeholders are on board, but it, three cases show that it's actually a very rare case that all three st stakeholders, meaning and the civil society and the state is fully on board and uh, uh, every, uh, and the business. But ideally, when all of them are on board, it, work, it works and functions perfectly. Uh, for me personally, it was also a new discovery because uh, actually small artificial intelligence elements, uh, digitalization actually can sometimes serve not as a substitute, but an, as a special, like a small element of um, rule of law instrument. For, for example, as I have mentioned, how all the data is analyzed by artificial intelligence and how it is done passed um, to the smallest um, committee to analyze. Um, sorry. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, I guess it's all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bogdana. Take a moment to uh, <laughs> recover your throat. Uh, you'll come back in the, uh, in the discussion then, of course. Um, it was a very concise overview, a very upbeat overview. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll turn it over to Elisa now, who, as you mentioned, Bogdana, uh, has been involved in uh, many, if not all, of these uh, uh, processes. Uh, and is certainly one of the best experts that, uh, that we could have to uh, discuss some of your findings and your paper. So, uh, Elisa, uh, Elisa, excuse me, over to you for your comments. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, firstly, I would like to uh, applaud the, the, the very idea of the research paper, because I think it's very important to look how the experience of Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova demonstrates us uh, a totally different trend in uh, digitalization of public services. And public procurement is perhaps not most expected uh, area of the uh, government that we would think would support um, innovation, 
new thinking, involvement of business in delivery of public services. And uh, this is all coming as a super interesting topic, especially when we look at how discussion continues about the models for the del delivery of digital public services, how to expand e-government, how to build a digital capacities in the public services, but also how to make it uh, progressive, how to make them in line with development of commercial markets and digital economy as such. And uh, in this respect, the, the, uh, the idea behind the paper is very good because it tells us to step back for a second and focus on what these countries managed to achieve and how uh, uh, the ideas born in Georgia around 2008 have developed into the success story of Prozoro in Ukraine uh, that was launched 2015 and how today Moldovan government is working with uh, Entenda to take these ideas forward. What I have found uh, very interesting and I would like to emphasize on it, it is that paper approaches the reform uh, from a perspective of public benefit and how these reforms impacted the market, uh, the business and the citizens. And I have found it very refreshing because typically we start looking at e-procurement as a tool to limit corruption, which is obviously very important. But what you see in the paper, you have a look at how the reform that was initially designed to tackle the corruption problem has actually brought to us a brand new ideas how to shape digital government services, not only in public procurement, but also in other areas of the government. And I think that this is one of the achievements of the paper, that these are very well pinpointed for audience, because we are all on the path from procurement being perceived in these countries as very corrupt, uh, very outdated, not bringing value for money, uh, close to the circle of oligarch um, suppliers linked to the government and not delivering the, the value for money or quality public services. And we see how Georgia uh, had to be brave and, and I totally applaud the, 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 the title of the chapter in the paper because it did require to be brave. I remember uh, the discussions around Georgian concept and I have to share with you an anecdote how the concept was presented at the WTO plenary session in Geneva. And Tato Rujumelashvili was presenting this brilliant idea of using electronic process, which is online end to end. So all activities are done online. There is not such thing that some is done outside the system and then you back and, and you move this online offline throughout the process. And that he was saying, well, we want to have everyone sees all principle in procurement. And the riot started in the room. First thing, how you want to make it in Georgia that doesn't have internet? And second, how you want to make everything visible when you know visa beats, proposals, commercial value, professional secrecy, confidentiality, how are you going to deal with it? And I remember sitting through this meeting and thinking, well, the idea overall has totally not different from what we have done in Poland uh, 10 years earlier, saying that public contract is public information and bid submitted in tender for public procurement is public, so everyone can access it. What this guy is trying to do, he's trying to move the process into the online communication and he wants to make this information that in Poland is accessible by going and asking for a copy of the document, simply sitting there on the web page. And I thought, this is brilliant. If he can do it on the technology level, we will have a very good approach to tackling the basic corruption, which is around obvious things like hiding public information, 
not sharing uh, the knowledge about how the government is planning to spend, not making the budgets public, and some other absolutely things that we consider today basic. So what Georgia did was indeed very brave and very difficult to understand for, uh, for the moment when it happened. And uh, we should be grateful because what Georgians they demonstrated, they demonstrated that yes, you can have an online process, Yes, this process can be real time recorded in open data that is published online. And yes, you may use the business uh, and citizens and the government working with the same data. And this was the achievement because until Georgia, we have this sort of acceptance that transparency is only as big as you can do it. Uh, confidentiality should prevail before citizens' interest. And uh, open data is this exotic topic that perhaps OECD talks about, but no one has seen it in real life. And out of the blue, we have seen it in Georgia. So uh, when we were running the first assessment of the system, uh, and I am not saying that the system was absolutely genius because it wasn't, but it has been doing three things. It was easy to use, so businesses could learn how to use it quickly. They didn't require any specific training to, uh, to learn how to use the platform. Uh, the auctions, they were really online, so people started to trust the selection process because if they could see the auction recorded online and progressing online and they could participate online, their uh, uh, consciousness about potential manipulation of the corrupt government uh, official was decreasing. And third thing, when they have seen the hours of the public contract recorded on the web page, and they knew that if the supplier would like to change this contract, the government will publish the changes. This was something that has changed the perception of public procurement everywhere. And this is also something that made the Prozoro possible. Without Georgia being brave about these features, we wouldn't have Prozoro. And we wouldn't have Prozoro not only because the, the same people who were behind the Georgian reform helped civic activists in Ukraine to, to, happen, to make the Prozoro pilot happen. So when I look at uh, the, how the uh, uh, innovation and achievements were building up, Ukrainians, they took all the positive lessons from Georgian case, and they have added up the missing bits from the perspective of how to transfer from the e-procurement system good for a small market to the e-procurement system good for the very big market. Because you have to understand that today, Prozoro handles about 4 million tenders annually. So this is good size economy even for developed uh, countries. So how to move from the scale of Georgian market, where we still have perhaps 30,000 tenders per year, to Ukraine when we have 4 million tenders per year. And what they have invented, they have invented or reinvented the business model for scaling up digital government service quickly for large market with low cost for the state budget. What they did essentially, they took a Portuguese model that was set up in 2008, where the government said, okay, we are standardizing public procurement services uh, through law and regulation and certification process. Any commercial platform who wants to work on this market has to certify and then participate in a tender for a framework agreement with the government to serve the market. But these platforms, they were working independently. So each has, has gone through the certification process. They were delivering the services. They were pretty successful. But the government, to get the data from this platform, had to actually ask the platforms to share the data. So uh, in time, the Portuguese decided that what they need, in addition to this platform, they need a core small system in the government that will be collecting, storing, and preserving public procurement data so the government can use this data for managing the market. 
So in essence, what Prozoro did, they took the Portuguese market concept, they took the Georgian experience of having the process online and open data, and they have built what any academic person would tell you, a shared service model between government and the business. And they made this model successful because what is being highlighted in the paper, they understood that this initial value of open data promoted in Georgia will help Ukrainians to uh, sort their own problem of government not being trusted by citizens and government not being trusted by business and government being reluctant to change the institutional habits from, you know, a, a version for Yanukovych to version post Maidan. Okay. And what they have added to experience from Georgia, Portuguese multi platform model, and central database unit in the government hands, they have implemented a brand new invention of open data standard for procurement. You will have it better explained in a paper, but in essence, this open data standard, open contracting data standard, allows platforms as many on the market as possible to share procurement data with the government in real time. This way, the government doesn't have to anymore build a big system that serves contracting authorities and suppliers. These systems can be built by commercial platforms because government will still have the data real time on every transaction as conducted on a platform on the government side in the central database unit. And this is something that was unachievable until Prozoro. Portuguese today, they are implementing exactly that. So they have just finished a program which is translating the open data in the uh, central database unit into OCBS model because they want exactly to have this. But it was Ukraine that demonstrated that this is technologically possible. So uh, looking at the paper, I think that uh, Bogdana will capture these two aspects of uh, innovation that has happened between Georgia and Ukraine, which was how to cater for the large market and how to build an e-procurement system which is cheap for the government. Because when I have talked to Portuguese government officials around 2008, while they have went for the commercial platforms model, the answer was absolutely simple. We didn't have the money to purchase state-owned system. That was answer number one. And answer number two was, no one was sure how to build e-procurement system to keep the pace with the market development. And we didn't want to end up with outdated system, which is not as progressive as we were hoping our digital economy will be. And this is where Ukraine has found an answer. And uh, this is also the reason why uh, at the bank we were keen to support Prozoro from the uh, pilot level, because we realized that if Prozoro is successful, it will demonstrate Firstly, that shared services are feasible for transition economy. So they are not only reserved you know, to the UK or some Californian uh, uh, provinces that are doing this for 20 years and everyone is happy, but also are feasible for transition market, no trust for the government, no money to build national level system, but also to persuade businesses to come to these platforms and compete genuinely compete for public tenders. So this is the lesson very nicely captured by Bogdana in the, in, in the chapter on, on Prozoro. And this is something that I find uh, uh, very helpful for myself to uh, look more critically at the achievement of Prozoro, but also more critically about what was the next step done in, in Moldova and where Moldova is today and who's going to be next. And I know that I should be lining up more work in front of Bogdana, but this is precisely what we should have in mind, that Moldova has taken from Prozoro, Georgian transparency standards, online, real-time information about everything about public procurement, 
they have taken the business model, which is shared services between government and commercial platforms, real-time publication on a, on a single window web portal of all information related to public procurement, and finally, what they have added. They have added this piece, which was um, impossible in Ukraine, because honestly speaking, Ukraine does not have still well-developed digital government infrastructure. Uh, E-procurement, it was an island. A new ideas sparked around success of Prozoro and made some other digital government services projects possible. In Moldova, it was the other way around. Moldova has successfully undergone uh, digitalization of majority of e of services and by 2016 they had if i remember correctly around 127 government services already available to citizens this was courtesy of huge investment by the world bank and european commission if not for that moldova wouldn't be ready for digital procurement and this is what you will see in the last chapter of the paper. It is how e-procurement changed into digital procurement. So machine readable data from every step of public procurement, including the connection to the planning with the state budget and including the payment for public contracts. So this is the achievement of Mtender that in case of Moldova, we have a dynamic connection between uh, government systems planning state budget in the treasury and procurement planning for the entire public sector. So whatever is being planned in the state budget can be tracked from state budget to procurement plan, to advertised tenders, to awarded contracts, to payments under these contracts, and then back into cycle of state budget planning. To be honest, I know three other worlds, uh, governments in the world who can achieve that, and they are super rich. So this is uh, something that uh, showed us where the idea from Prozoro can, can be taken to. So you can have a fully digital online real-time process between state budget and payment for the public contracts. Achievable for the small country? Yes. Achievable for transitional economy? Yes. <sighs> Supported politically? Not entirely. Uh, driven by, uh, well, civil society and business who started to believe that if Ukrainians manage to do it, Moldova can do it and can uh, build up the, the profile of the public procurement in the country, which was traditionally very low, and they have done it. So when you will look at the perception of the public procurement in Moldova, it's not as dramatically improving as uh, in Ukraine, but uh, it's worth uh, mentioning that these, uh, this statistic that is put in the paper, that Moldova managed to save almost 25 million within 12 months of the Entender operation is very uh, significant. And we should also see that the value of the system has also been demonstrated during the COVID pandemic, when the government pushed some spending outside electronic procurement, just to come back today to the electronic procurement. Because it's hard to believe, but during the pandemic year, M tender was still saving money for the government. So uh, I was very happy to read the paper. So thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity. And what I see as the core value of looking at the paper, it is to uh, understand how specific innovation that was born from initial ideas in Georgia progressed to Prozoro move from Prozoro to, uh, to uh, Entenda. And uh, the next project where we uh, expect uh, this concept to be further developed is a project with the government of Uzbekistan. And Uzbekistan also doesn't have, you know, the most bright tradition of transparent government. 
and trust of the civil society and the enthusiasm of business for participating in public contract. So we do hope that uh, the ideas that were born in Georgia uh, will be progressing and we will have new innovation coming and building on these uh, achievements that were highlighted in the paper. Thank you very much, Eliza. I think this was a very enthusiastic uh, endorsement of uh, Bogdana's research, um, much appreciated. Um, I can first of all uh, invite only everybody to post their questions in the chat. I see one from Julian Brummer, uh, which, by, which I will leave for the for the second round, because I would like to have one uh, one round of uh, questions, perhaps looking back at uh, how it worked uh, um, and what it took actually uh, to uh, uh, instate this uh, these systems of e procurement. And I would like in the second round, and this is what Julian's question relates to, uh, look at uh, where the areas might be for uh, an expansion of this experience, whether it's other countries or whether it's in country. Uh, in the countries that we heard about. Um, so I'd like to divide it up a little bit. So uh, let me go ahead with the question. Others should feel free to add, uh, uh, add questions in the chat. I mean, what did it actually take uh, to uh, introduce uh, these systems? Uh, there must have been major obstacles uh, uh, to all of this. It is not easy to cut through obstacles. Elisa, uh, you also mentioned some of the skepticism at the, uh, at the WTO. Uh, so I imagine that with sort of very strong vested interests inside of individual countries, uh, sort of established relationships, uh, also established benefits, obviously, from the previous system. What did it take? Uh, what were the obstacles? Uh, how did individual countries, also individual governments, um, sets of stakeholders from politics to civil society to business actually managed to overcome these. Perhaps I, uh, I could ask both of you for a, a concise take on, uh, on this. What did it take? What were the obstacles? And how did uh, the, the process manage to overcome these, uh, these impediments? Bogdana? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elisa, for, uh, for the nice, uh, interesting comments. Uh, it's inspirational uh, to continue the research. Uh, and uh, indeed, um, uh, it's, um, as uh, we have mentioned, it's the, for me, I called it uh, uh, the Georgia as a brave uh, pioneer, uh, simply because I remember once uh, when uh, pres uh, well former president uh, Saakashvili was in Kiev and he was explaining his reform path, he was like, you know, Georgia is so small, everyone is relative to someone. So when you make a reform, you touch everyone you you immediately have like 10 phone calls because uh you uh, it's a tiny country like in ukraine if you do any type of reform you might not meet these people in three years so be brave be bold and for him according to what i understood and uh, for the reformers the commitment and uh, uh was to overall general transparency and to inclusion of everyone because it was not because every reform, if properly implemented, then obviously it cuts the links to the previous corrupt and unique uh, type of services. So the fact, uh, so the, their idea was to open up the system to say, we are not cutting anyone out, we are including everyone in. So come and bring your relatives and bring more relatives and let everyone compete and uh, let everyone uh, develop the state. So this was um, the overall, uh, for me, like the philosophy of this opening up uh, of the state and making more, more transparent and easier to scrutinize for everyone. Uh, for Ukraine, the challenge was different because so it was already during the second uh, revolution and uh, if speaking of the political context, so during the first uh, uh, political, uh, during the first revolution, people went home believing that the state will do their job and that from one day to another, everything will start reforming, which was not the case. 
uh, with the second uh, uh, revolution, people started saying like, uh, well, it can be that we will have the state stable and supporting the reforms, but maybe not. So the biggest obstacle was this total mistrust in the system and uh, which actually became uh, the biggest uh, strength because they have managed to diversify the entry points into the system of, uh, of the state procurement and to make business and civil society and the state equally important and sitting on the same kind of table and being equally important and equally responsible for the success when one cannot be without the other. So, um, and uh, Moldova, uh, the biggest obstacle for Moldova was actually how to put the very good practices already into place and to make it functional because uh, there was a big resistance uh, in the state itself but uh, at the same time some realized that there is a need of this e-procurement the civil society could not get through the state and actually this where the civil society came in was uh, when they have and this is something which uh, Elisa has mentioned capitalized so to say on the uh, on the coronavirus when the civil society made a coalition and demanded the medical supplies to be a part uh, of the state procurement because uh, nobody knew how the medical supplies are delivered, who is buying them, who, who is producing them, who are the companies, etc. So actually, uh, let's say every state had its own uh, obstacles, but at the same time, uh, they all served as a creative way out. And now, uh, actually, uh, Moldova is one of the unique cases when the medical uh, supplies are the part of the state, uh, will be eventually, when properly implemented, will be uh, eventually the part of the state uh, procurement, which is not the case uh, in many, many countries around the world. So, uh, proudly, obstacles, yes, but uh, gladly, all of them have changed the e-procurement actually into a stronger system. Thank you very much, Bogdana. Um, uh, Elisa, what's your, what's your take on this? And perhaps I add a question here just prompted by Bogdana. Uh, what are typically the areas that are exempt from the system? There must be areas of public procurement that are not covered by the system. Are there any or am I mistaken, Elisa? Yes, uh, so the, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the answer is that, of course, not everything can be put on the e-procurement system and not everything can be automated. Uh, we have uh, this case about defense procurement, which is very strong outside the standard transparency rules for a good reason. And these are hardly unlikely to end up on any e-procurement system. However, you have to remember that uh, Prozoro in Ukraine was first used in central government by the Ministry of Defense. And they were purchasing uniforms, food, uh, technical equipment, IT equipment for their army during the conflict on the East. And they have tested the capacity of Prozoro in practice on a very early days. And I have to tell you honestly that after talking to the Ministry of Defense in Ukraine, I thought, okay, if these guys can use it, everyone can use it. So the answer is uh, basically uh, looking, we, are, we have to be looking not at the complexity of procurement, not at uh, the procurement method, not on the policy or transparency requirements. We have to look at the market where this procurement should happen. And if we have markets traditionally excluded like defense, there are places somewhere else. But everything else, starting from micro value contracts, because you need to, uh, have in mind that Portugal, when they were emerging from crisis, they made a very clear message to the government officials. Yes, you award these contracts outside public procurement law, but you report every contract from one euro in the database for public contracts. Because we want to know how the public budget is spent. And we have to be accountable to citizens for every euro you spend. And this did the miracle. So what we, what we strongly will believe, we believe that e-procurement system is for micro-level market, for low value, for high value, and for complex procedures. Because what, what I have on, on my lab work at the moment, uh, it is uh, an automated uh, online evaluation 
for energy efficiency saving contracts. Uh, these methodologies, they typically tackle around 20 different technical criteria that are provided by the supplier during the bid for such a project. And, on the, and being a lawyer, I would be scared. 20 something indicators, how to build them into an algorithm. And I went to the data modelers who are working in, with Prozoro and they were laughing at me. They were like, Elisa, 80 something, it's a piece of cake. And I was like, okay, can you do it? Yeah, can you come back in six weeks and we will show you a prototype? Okay, I did come back in six weeks and they did show me the prototype. And this is no longer shocking to me because I know it can be done. But this is down to our personal experience with technology. Oops, my apologies. I was disconnected. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I saw in the meantime, Elisa, that you uh, responded already to, to Julian's question. Uh, I would still like to take the, uh, the issue up in, a, in the second round of uh, uh, questions and comments, which is um, taking, uh, I mean, starting out from the experience in the three countries that you both described so, uh, so well, uh, what is the potential here in two directions? The one is obviously, uh, Elisa, you indicated Uzbekistan, uh, a transfer of experiences here to other geographies, whether it's other countries in the region or beyond, uh, as far as the level even of the European Union that was mentioned in the question. Uh, what is the potential for this sort of geographical uh, uh, transfer of the experience that, as we heard, uh, worked so well? in three countries of Eastern Europe. And the other question would be more sort of internal, sort of deepening. Uh, is there a potential for uh, building on the e-procurement experience in the direction of deepening e-governance? Are there other areas where you can basically now, as a next step or several next steps, uh, basically further digitalize other areas in the relationship between citizens and governments, businesses and governments, civil society, other stakeholders, uh, what, uh, what is the potential uh, there? So geography, sort of broadening uh, and e-governance deepening uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, especially also in the three countries that, uh, uh, that we're talking about. Uh, Bogdana, your thoughts on this? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So uh, with regards to geography, uh, in some parts of the paper, I discuss it how actually, so everything came uh, from Georgia to Ukraine, from Ukraine to Moldova, then parts of it from Ukraine went to, uh, to Georgia. I believe that some parts of it will go from uh, Moldova back uh, to Ukraine, especially with regards uh, to the e-components from Ukraine. It was more about how to use the artificial uh, intelligence uh, to analyze the data. So it went back uh, to Moldova. So there is this constant uh, interaction within the region. And uh, according to me, the countries are reinforcing uh, each other from their positive experience. At the same time, um, and here maybe uh, Elisa will step in with more details, but for example, what uh, Moldova has achieved gives Moldova access to the international procurement. So Moldova can actually uh, go out from the state internationally, having built all these uh, systems already. And with regards uh, to the third point, uh, uh, with regard to the spillovers. So, for example, uh, in Ukraine, the spillover went also into the banking, but also, uh, for example, in Georgia, it, it had an impressive uh, spillover with regards to the literacy of people. Uh, because uh, Elisa has mentioned that at the beginning, everybody was laughing because from one day to another, you demand uh, people from uh, who are in some remote uh, villages to actually participate in this uh, on internet, etc. So, like to make the tenders. Uh, so it has actually forced the people and the general public to become to become more literate uh, in uh, in technology. Uh, 
uh, for example, again, like in Ukraine, it has also spilled into the land market reform because like now uh, land is another element where there is uh, there was traditional a lot of uh, corruption and historically it's very painful element. So now the the discussion is on the way on there. So therefore it's uh, uh, yeah, it's a question of imagination. Uh, how it can spill and to which areas is a question of political will. It's a question of, uh, I think, uh, staying motivated as well, like for civil society, for uh, politicians, for business to continue uh, enhancing the, the reform itself. Thank you, Bogdana. Uh, Elisa, over to you. Well, in terms of... Uh market value of what these countries have done, uh, they have done a breakthrough which is on the technology level comparable only to blockchain. Because they have invented a, a technology stack that is handling real-time, online, multi-platform distributed architecture transactions on a large scale. So in other words, they have been a public sector prototype of Amazon. They did it. How we take it forward is dependent totally on political will of the governments. And this is where the difference with blockchain is very visible because blockchain is a commercial technology with a bunch of vendors inventing into it and selling it globally. Here, we have an invention that has grown from civic tech activists, transparency activists, and overcoming governance problems. So we don't have a seller of this idea. This is an idea that is promoted by the civil society. So the question about the impact and the future, it is about whether we recognize the value of the invention not promoted by the commercial vendor who makes money out of it, but the invention that changed the face of the government in Georgia, in Ukraine and Moldova, and we can all learn from it because it's an open source. So in terms of the where we can find ourselves uh, using this uh, uh, approach, we need to be aware that today, technologically, it is possible uh, for a um, seller in Moldova to bid in Ukraine using its own platform in Moldova if not prevented by the government regulation for cross-border trade. Technically, they can do it because they have networking platforms on both sides, data standards on both sides, similar EU policy harmonized in Ukraine, harmonized in Moldova. So this is almost one-to-one. -one. In case of the EU member states on the policy level, it should be one-to-one. -one. What this invention does it's bringing the market openness from the policy level to the actual press the button IT software, which allows you to, to sell and buy. So using it for cross-border transaction, it's a question of finding a brave government to try it. And uh, I am looking for such, obviously, because this is my job at the bank <laughs> to, to promote the, the innovation. But... Uh, Speaking about this, of course, we have a huge interest from the European Commission, uh, which when I was talking to them about M10 three years ago, they were like, you want to have digital European single procurement document in Moldova? And I was like, yes, because Moldova has all digital registers. So why shouldn't I be doing this? Okay. And some other, you know, similarly surprised comments. But um, what we see on the practical level, it is that the government um, are still very risk averse towards the emerging technologies uh, and very prefer to trust big vendors telling them that this is risk free enterprise is just going to cost a lot of money. And this is the question whether this attitude will be changed after a pandemic or not because pandemic demonstrated to all of us the, the value of online communication, the value of doing procurement electronically, 
the value of being able to work from home like we do today, which even a year ago was you know, unheard of for a lot of developed countries, perhaps minus US and Australia because of the scale and distance they were using it already. So uh, the question about future is not the question about what technology allows us. What te technology allows us, we already know. What policy concepts were tested, we also already know. The rest is down to politics. Thank you, Elisa. I couldn't agree more. But uh, I also have to, uh, to say that uh, one of your last observations was, I think, particularly encouraging, uh, as uh, was much of this discussion so far, which is uh, how the system also contributes to uh, connecting countries of the region. Because more often than not, it seems that uh, these countries are very sort of individualized, um, uh, also in their relationship, uh, 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 sort of directed more towards the outside world, whether it's the EU or Russia or other neighbors, but within the region, there seems, there seems to be a sort of uh, lack of, of connections more often than not, also in the field of infrastructure, but as we, uh, as we just heard, um, there is quite some potential in this e-procurement system or in these systems that have been have been introduced uh, to also build uh, uh, build connections within uh, uh, within the Eastern Europe region or the Eastern Partnership region. Uh, so another piece of I think uh, very encouraging news that that comes out for me personally in this uh, in this discussion. Uh, with that, we've already unfortunately reached our time limits. Um, I have to say that this was a most substantial, most encouraging, most interesting discussion for me, and I hope certainly for all of you in the uh, in the audience, uh, a, a sort of model case for what you would like to have with uh, with this Rethink CE Fellowship with the fellows um, like Bogdana, the papers like the one on e-procurement that we heard about and obviously with commentators uh, uh, like Elisa. So uh, for me, this was a very well-rounded discussion. Applause, uh, especially to Bogdana and, uh, and Elisa for joining us this afternoon. Many thanks to all of you in the audience uh, who joined us here. Uh, let me also, by way of sort of self-promotion, uh, uh, announce immediately that in two weeks' time, uh, on Wednesday in two weeks, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, we will have a next event uh, within this series. At that time, my colleague Daniel Hegedusch will take over uh, um, with a session on measuring democracy, uh, something that sounds very abstract, but um, as many indices have, uh, have tried to do, uh, has very practical dimensions. So this is going to be our next topic. Uh, I announced it here already, but the invitations uh, will go out to all of you uh, within the next couple of days. I'm looking forward to see you all at this next occasion. And I thank again uh, Bogdana and Elisa for being with us this afternoon for what I thought was a fascinating uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Be healthy. Bye then. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.